I'm, I'm going to move over to our last but not least uh, panelist today, um, Richard Cobb, who is on my right. Richard is the Evidence and Impact Advisor at Merlin, where he's worked on creating organization-wide M&E and accountability systems with a focus on combining evidence from a variety of sources, including the viewpoints of affected people. And since 2011, he's also um, represented uh, Merlin at the CDAC, Communicating with Disaster Affected Communities Network. And he was recently named the vice chair of the network. And we also have Rachel Houghton here in the front row, who is the, uh, the chair. So um, Richard, uh, I'm going to, I wanted to ask you a bit, given your M&E background, um, how, I mean, how can we better monitor the impact of beneficiary communications projects? I mean, what kind of indicators, qualitative or quantitative, are useful for demonstrating the value of these projects and approaches? Brilliant. Thank you, Wendy. Um, like a good m and &E person, I'm going to start by taking apart the question. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the essence here is about sort of how, how do we monitor, how do we demonstrate impact? Um, and I think sort of jumping immediately to indicators is perhaps uh, the, the, the wrong approach. We have to, to bear in mind that impact is often a very intangible thing, um, and it really does depend on whose perspective um, uh, we're looking at. Um, I think uh, we've had some really good practice demonstrated here today, but for me, um, the most important aspect is about having a balance between the regular uh, monitoring of, of, of indicators alongside um, more qualitative review evaluation processes that allow us to, to look back at what has changed. Uh, the measurement of impact is, of course, trying to articulate what we have seen as, as changed in any, any given context. Um, Part of that, of course, is understanding what would happen if um, we hadn't intervened, what changes or not changes would have occurred there. And, and, and of course, that means looking at so-called counterfactual or control groups to, to understand if we hadn't done anything, what, what would have occurred. And, and if, uh, if the changes that we've observed would have occurred without our intervention, what does that tell us about the uh, the value for money for uh, the investment in, in any any um, intervention? Um, and I'll come on a little bit to talk about value for money in a minute. Um, the other part of the question was about um, beneficiary communication projects, and I wanted to, to challenge that slightly by saying that um, Merlin, like <laughs> like many many other uh, humanitarian <laughs> organisations, are, are, are really trying to embed these quality ways of working within our our regular work. Um, having uh, independent pilots and, 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 and studies are, are crucial for, for um, uh, proving the case for the inclusion of, of, of any aspect of quality work I in, in regular programming. Um, uh, but in reality, the aim here is to, is to try and make this uh, a standard part of, of the way that we work. And so, as I say, and, uh, uh, like like man, many other humanitarian workers, Merlin um, uh, uh, is genuinely trying to include beneficiary communication, two-way communication, alongside our work on accountability as part of our core programming. So that said, having destroyed the question, um, <laughs> I'm going to attempt to answer it now. Um, effectively, all of this starts with some kind of hypothesis. Um, InfoZaid had a great hypothesis, which was what happens uh, when you do better um, communication uh, and, and what are the components that allow us to, to be better communicators. Um, so we need to have that, that, that hypothesis and I think that happens at an organisational level um, and I think it happens at a programme and a project level and, and, and they're all equally important. Um, a lot of what I'm about to say actually is, is very well articulated in, in, in the report here. Um, one of the crucial aspects is about disaggregating data um, understanding um, between ages and sexes who is able to access certain um, information and when and how do they use it is absolutely crucial to us being able to understand what effect and impact uh, the information we're giving is. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a, a quote here um, from CDAC Network's um, research um, discussion paper uh, that says that um, uh, what we really need to do is to understand the gap between what 
um, aid providers or humanitarian organisations think they're communicating and what is actually heard by communities and individuals. Um, and for me, that, that articulates very nicely the, the, the kind of importance we need to place on uh, not just looking at our own systems of delivery, um, but also engaging with individuals and communities and making sure that we're dealing with um, vulnerable and, and marginalised groups as well to understand actually what's being heard. Uh, I think quite often we're good at measuring what we've done, but not necessarily who has access to it. Um, Mark nicely um, highlighted the importance of um, information needs assessments. Fr from an M&E point of view, this is very much the starting point. If we can understand uh, what information is, is flowing prior to any crisis, uh, between who and how, uh, and then also uh, during and, and in recovery phases, how that information need is changing and the channels are changing, we are going to be much better able to understand what our communication interventions are, are achieving. Um, something that, again, that the report highlights is, is the importance to uh, understand what people do with that information. Um, an awful lot of uh, life-saving information, I think it was mentioned before, as to whether, whether uh, SMS received are just binned and, and ignored. If we can understand the, the, the rate at which information is taken up and used, it will better able us to tailor that information provision in the future. Uh, I want. Well, I said that I would come and talk a little bit about value for money. Mark gave a fantastic um, example from Haiti, uh, which I totally agree uh, should and could be explored much further. Um, and I think that we can quantify a lot of the investment uh, in two-way communication, be that technology-based or not. Uh, but the, the difficult angle to, to crack is, is how, how the value of that is, is um, articulated. And again, that means talking to uh, people that have received information and understanding how important it is to them and, and not devaluing that um, because it's qualitative compared to a very quantitative um, uh, uh, consideration. Are we having microphone problems? No, Sorry. you're, oh, okay. you're <laughs> fine. <laughs> fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the value for money debate uh, is definitely two, two halves of the same coin, and I think it's very important that we remember that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the longer term in terms of M&E as well. Uh, it's, how's that? Is that better? <laughs> Fine, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really important, I think, that we don't get lost in focusing what's been achieved from a single um, crisis or a single response. Um, and looking over time and having standard uh, M&E methodologies over time that allow us to cross compare um, will give us uh, a, a really s strong and better understanding of what interventions make the most sense. Uh, again, referring back to Mark's example of uh, six pence per person per day, uh, it sounds fantastic, but we don't actually have an evidence base that we're able to benchmark against. And this longer-term view of, of building up that evidence base, I think, is crucial. Um, we also, I think, need to remember to measure when crises don't have the effect that, that they might have done and what role communi uh, communication has within that. Uh, a, a little example um, from, from Aceh last year when there was a tsunami warning based on an earthquake. Uh, Reputedly, uh, the city um, fled to the hills based on um, based on the early warning system. Unlike in two thousand and four five, when of course um, it was devastating, uh, we need to start measuring what happens uh, when communication is effective. That people have the information they need, uh, and crises in terms <laughs> of their impact on on lives are averted. I think that's it. Thanks, Richard. Um, I also wondered if you could tell us a bit more about what's well, been mentioned several times, and uh, you have a role in that, the CDAC network. And now that the Info as Aid project has ended, um, are there elements of the work that's been done that CDAC intends to carry on or further or incorporate into its research agenda? Yeah, I mean, s certainly from, from an, an M&E and research point of view, um, uh, 
the network obviously is 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 made up of uh, of international um, and in the future national um, NGOs, media development organisations, and and technology providers. But we're also partnering with a number of the quality and accountability initiatives, uh, and also with um, uh, academia through um, the uh, Tufts and Feinstein Institute. Um, the network has as a core component of its deliverables mm. uh, a research and learning agenda. I th we have recently had a, a sort of a really um, uh, engaging discussion about how we might um, come together to, to contribute to a joint evidence base. Uh, the intention will be to, to build a, a network-wide monitoring and evaluation framework, providing some of those indicators that we can all take away and use uh, within our own work that will contribute to that to that evidence base. Um, the vision would be that there would be um, uh, longitudinal studies, so um, studies over time looking at the difference that has been made from one crisis to the next, as well as looking at those specific response um, uh, uh, pieces of work. Um, and not just limited to that um, uh, shared m and &E framework, but by commissioning bespoke pieces of research, really trying to, to look at some of the questions that the InfoSA project, uh, amongst others, have, have generated for us that still need answering. Um, the, the sort of the, the, the principle behind uh, a, a lot of the, the, the work that the, the network wants to do on research and learning is to make sure that affected populations are involved in defining what is measured and when um, to, to mitigate some of the challenges that I, I think I've highlighted already. Uh, of course, uh, research papers um, uh, and, and, and documents like this HPM report are invaluable in terms of, of putting out into the sector this, this body of evidence. Uh, but the network also wants to take that further and, and produce practical guidance um, uh, to aid practitioners in, in writing in to a communication to their existing work. Um, and I think there's a, there's a sense that uh, one of the most important streams is to, to demonstrate the, the added value of the collaboration of NGOs, media development organizations, technology providers, and others in bringing about better, uh, more holistic communications. Uh, and again, uh, the InfoSA project has, has produced some fantastic tools that, that can and should be taken forward by the network, uh, by the network and the sector um, to, um, to, to enable us to collaborate and coordinate better. Uh, so th th there are uh, lots of things going on. Sure, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and we've mentioned a bit about CDAC and Infos Aid. Uh, I think it's important to highlight also the work that HAP is doing in terms of trying to uh, demonstrate and, and systematically demonstrate the impact uh, of uh, the impact and value for money of work on on broader accountability issues. Um, OCHA are also doing quite a lot of work in terms of demonstrating and piloting how coordination of communica communication activities is happening. So yeah, uh, plen plenty to be getting on with for for the network and the sector. Great, thank you very much. Now